Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for joining uh, today's uh, intern sharing day by Open Government Products. So just a quick rundown of how today will go. We'll start with a short introduction to the team by our director, Hong. And then we'll have sharings by three of our software engineer interns. Uh, and then we'll end off with a question and answer panel. So if you do have any questions, um, please send, uh, send them to the pigeonhole, which Ihan is sharing on the chat right now. Um, so to get us started, I'll pass it to Hong. All right. Hey, everyone. Thanks for, thanks for joining us tonight. Um, so yeah, just to give you guys a, a quick intro to who we are and what we do. Um, so OGP is, uh, OGP is Open Government Products. We're a sort of new experimental product development team in the government. We're made up of engineers, data, uh, data scientists, PMs, and designers. Um, and basically what we do is we build tech for the public good. Um, the idea is that you know you hear about all tech companies having all these new modern uh, modern techniques and modern technologies and modern organizational practices for how they run their teams and things like that and you know if they can do these sort of things for you know doing online delivery or watching videos or, or like doing advertising um the thought was well what if we can do that for government and what if we can get you know what if we can build an organization that functions like a modern tech company but works on public sector problems um and that's that's basically where I'm trying to get to. My 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 belief of the team is that you know, uh, that that as much as private sector has a lot of good things that you can build and do, you can't substitute, uh, you can't substitute the public sector. Like if the government doesn't work, the the society doesn't work. And so we should have at least some fraction of uh, you know the, the sort of innovation and and intelligence and drive and creativity, at, that goes into building um, you know that goes into building sort of like e-commerce websites go into building education, healthcare, and like transportation and, and all that sort of thing. Um, so yeah, I, that's the team. Uh, we're about like, I don't know, about 50 people right now. And we have a whole bunch of interns this summer and we're really open to having interns on board because we, you know, we, I really strongly believe in like having people who have the sort of the aptitude and interest way more experience. Cause I believe if you have aptitude and interest, uh, even without a whole bunch of experience, you can do it, get a lot of stuff done. And on the team, we try to um, we try to treat interns like you know full time staff uh, as, in terms of responsibilities, uh, in terms of the impact they have on the team. Because you know, I, 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 that the whole part of the team is to bring uh, bring good people on board and sort of you know let them do their work. Um, and so tonight we're gonna be uh, we're gonna be doing some sharings from some of the, uh, from uh, from just a handful of some some of the software engineering interns who've been with us over the past couple of months and and a lot of the good work they've done. Um, I'm really excited. Uh, I'm really excited, uh, you know, for, for you guys to be here and for you guys to see this because I, I think we've, um, well, I hope that, uh, you know, we, we've done some pretty cool work and, you know, uh, both, both, uh, both, both from on like on behalf of uh, the, uh, on the individuals who hopefully had a good experience, you know, here, here getting stuff built, but also from the perspective of like the country of like the things they built here are not just little toy apps that we're showing off in a small case, but these are production things that are going to be, that have or are going to be launched and going to go out to members of the public and going out to citizens um, for people to use. So yeah, um, without further ado, I mean, thanks, uh, thanks, for, thanks for joining us and I will, uh, let, let, let's get this started. Sarah, up to, off to you. Thanks, Hong. So our first intern today is Ahmed. He is a year four NUS student studying computer science. Uh, and he's currently on a six month internship with OGP working on pay SG and redeem SG. So Ahmed, over to you. Thanks, Aaron. Hold on, let me just uh, share my screen. <laughs> All right, I'm just gonna assume that everyone can see uh, and that you're seeing the right things. So yeah, uh, hi everyone. For those who don't know me here, uh, my name's Ahmed. Uh, very brief intro, uh, you know, NUS year four, majoring in computer science. Uh, my focus area is actually in computer security. So just a little bit of background. Uh, kind of came in here, you know, trying to figure out, do I really want to be a software engineer? Do I want to pivot cybersecurity and whatnot? Uh, I also taught software engineering, program methodology one and two as a TA when I was in NUS and when I am still in NUS, uh, currently a software engineering technician. Okay, so what will I be sharing with you guys today? Uh, my intern story, but specifically my intern story so far, it's not really done. Uh, still got another few months with OGP and doing an APAP for those in NUS who are familiar. Uh, so how I'll be doing this is I'll be sharing you guys my experiences and takeaways, right? So I'll, I'll go, I'll walk through the kind of experiences I had uh, with interview and onboarding, as well as, you know, my first feature working for PSG, and then uh, 
productionizing PSG for an actual agency use case. And then after that, productionizing it in terms of DevOps, you know, I talk about deployment, monitoring, logging. And then currently what I'm doing now, which is uh, working on the DMSG. And uh, each one of these experiences, I'll also share with you guys a short takeaway into uh, sort of like my insights into what OGP is about and sort of the key uh, takeaways, I guess, yeah, <laughs> that I got from this experience. Okay, so interview and onboarding, the beginning. Uh, how this starts, obviously it starts with an interview, but I think one thing that really sort of sealed the deal for me was uh, I got very detailed feedback. Uh, I was, I, you know, you know how some companies when you apply, they just kind of ghost you and then other companies, uh, they don't ghost you. But when you try and ask, hey, so uh, where, where could I improve? And they don't really get back to you. But OGP was uh, very thorough on that. Uh, during the onboarding itself, I think I spent the first week, you know, just sort of discuss, discussing with my reporting officer, we call them ROs here in OGP, on how to sort of shape it. And it was interesting because, you know, hear about experiences from other people talking about how uh, they just go into ship and then they're given things to do and then they just sort of get them done. Uh, but it was really this tone that was set on my first day where my ROs was like, so how do you want this to play out? Uh, I was actually given a sort of stake in how I wanted my internship to go into how I wanted it to form and sort of things that I would work on. And that really sort of continued on, even until now, uh, constantly, you know, discussing my RO, you know, reevaluating, okay, maybe I want to take it a different direction or a different product sort of thing. And the sort of key takeaway I got from this is that uh, OGP and the mentors themselves are really invested in your learning. I think I was mentioning before about the thing that sealed the deal. Uh, I was, you know, considering different offers at the same time, uh, but sort of one of the key factors was, you know, you always talk about, so what's the point of an internship? You're going here to learn. And when you're here to learn, the idea is that you want people who are invested in your learning. You want people who care about your growth as an individual. And that sort of really uh, was something that I found in OGP. So moving on to my first feature for pay.gov, uh, .sg, sorry, uh, user login. Uh, it was quite a monumental task at first. I asked for this feature actually because uh, I was keen on security domain. So I was thinking, hey, uh, what, what sort of security elements are they involved in uh, software engineering? So OGP does logins in a relatively unique way. Uh, if you guys ever tried to use our products, I think you'll see. So we actually went through a comprehensive development life cycle. So what I mean by this, uh, my mentor, my RO, sorry, I like to refer to him as a mentor because I see him more as a mentor and you know, someone you report to. So usually I'll use the terminology quite interchangeably. You know, my mentor uh, made me sort of flesh out an entire technical document, uh, made me propose it to the entire team. You know, all these senior software engineers and you're like, whoa. Uh, <laughs> then I had to, you know, go through the actual development, testing and deployment even. And it was, it was quite tough at first because, you know, I thought, hey, you know, I, this isn't my first time doing software engineering work, but there were so many things that were rejected at first. Uh, but I sort of pushed through and the key takeaway I guess I got was uh, never be afraid to ask for help. And I think this is one of the things that sort of appeals to me in OGP is that everyone's really friendly. Okay, maybe my team, but I haven't worked with uh, the entire, but so far the experience has been that everyone's really helpful. Uh, everyone's sort of willing to, you know, take some time to help you through something that you, you know, to them it might be easy and hey, uh, very well might be, but you've never seen it before. And they're really very willing. And I really sort of appreciated that throughout my journey, working on my first feature. And then we go on into sort of productionizing the product. Uh, what I mean by this is uh, in order for it to actually be released as a product that will be used actively by agencies in their day-to-day -day operations. So in order to do this, there were quite a lot of things that we had to do. Uh, I think one of the key things was actually we had to speak to these agencies <laughs> and go down and conduct user trials. Very interesting, a software engineer uh, being involved in this sort of product discussion, being involved in this sort of uh, UX experiences, and you actually see, you know, a lot of times you make these things and you're thinking, hey, uh, how people actually use them. And then there's actually a sort of structured way to go about gathering these experiences and then, you know, reiterating and fixing it uh, before you send it out and then people start using it and be like, hey, something's wrong. Uh, this actually led to the removal of a core feature for our product. Um, and there were many long hours discussing, you know, how receipts should be displayed, you know, what a sort of experience. And there's, there's, there's just a lot of discussion. 
And the most important thing I sort of took away from that is uh, the idea of not so much the importance of questions, but contextually, you know, the importance of questions when it comes to an environment that supports product autonomy. Because you, you don't get this a lot in a lot of places. And I'm going to be very frank here. This is not just me upselling OTP, but uh, I did have uh, some of my friends who were working, you know, software engineering, and they're like, the product is already more or less there. You, know, you have requirements, you just work on the requirements. But the thing about products in OGP is that the engineers have a very big stake into how the product evolves, how the product develops. Uh, but this also comes with it a set of responsibilities. Responsibilities to ask important questions, responsibilities to make sure that you understand more concretely why you're building what you're building. This is not just about do X. It's about why am I you know, building X? And in that sort of environment, questions become a lot more important. And that nature of you know, being curious and critical and all that. <laughs> Uh, all right, so moving on to productionizing pay. Uh, this is more related to DevOps work and something I was quite interested because, you know, you code and you build, but how do you get it out? How do you actually deploy it? You know, uh, a lot of times in our school projects, you just sort of push a button, uh, but how do you get it to work at scale? You know, what if you have like 100 people using it? How do you migrate then from Heroku to an actual cloud solution like AWS? How do you know it's working? So we, I helped deploy, you know, sort of uptime health, talk about Pingdom and CloudWatch alarms. And what happens if it doesn't work, you know? So this is where, uh, what well, I like to call the art of logging. <laughs> so my mentor told me uh, the idea that you could really sort of uh, pin down what went wrong and where, if you know how to log properly, if you know how to pass your logs, how to get insight from your logs. And this, you might, it might seem trivial, it might seem like, oh, this is this operational work, but a lot of times, uh, it's, it shouldn't be the tools, you know, that turn you off. Uh, I think one of the key takeaways I got from productionizing it in this manner was the kind of focus on metrics in the sense that you, you hear about all these things like uh, CloudWatch, you know, uh, you know, AW, uh, all these sort of monitoring tools, Winston Logging, Morgan Logging, uh, you know, you have real-time user interactions and that sort of thing. But uh, you tend to forget what are you actually, why are you actually using them for? You know, um, it's really about a focus on the metrics and you should really think about first, uh, what do I need to know before you go about trying to find, okay, how can I find, how can I find out about these things? And the how is where the tools come in. And now to my last point, uh, which is currently what I'm working on now, <laughs> uh, Redeem SG is a pretty big epic I'm doing on. Uh, I'll just sort of, you know, uh, set up an entirely new repo using a template, develop the login flow, yada, yada, deploy it. And it might seem like it's very monitored, but I think it's we already done. This is something that I've experienced in. But what I didn't know about was how to use my info and the amount of time I spent doing everything in the first three points was equivalent to the amount of time I've spent reading my info documentation, reading API documentation. And the key takeaway from this is that uh, don't, underestimate, and it goes back to an earlier point I made about you know asking questions. I know not being afraid to ask questions because you've never, in some instances, you've just never done it before, but there are people who have, and they know the sort of quirks that you might uh, get blocked by. So, you know, experience matters in the sense that don't underestimate, I guess, how hard it might be and always be willing to ask questions. And with that, I'm done to be continued because still got a couple more months, sorry, yeah, more months left. And I'll hand over the time back to Sarah. Thank you very much. Thanks, Ahmed. Um, so next up, we have uh, Jia Chin, who is a year four NTU computer science student. He's currently on a seventh month internship with OGP and working on Form SG, Redeem SG, and Pay SG. Chin, over to you. Right, so I'm assuming that again, everyone can see my screen, which is, which should be the one on the forms intern sharing. So what I'm going to be presenting to you today is just a quick sharing on my time here at forms. What are some of the challenges I face and my journey throughout uh, my four months of working on forms from the start until how it is now. So let me start with a brief introduction. My name is Chin. Um, I don't have a huge picture, sadly enough, like Ahmed. So I'm the really, I'm the guy standing in the back on the left. And I'm a final year CS and this student at NTU. 
I've been fortunate enough to work on forms for the past four months and I've been working on plenty of interesting stuff. So some stuff include factor, refactoring and migrating the backend from JavaScript to TypeScript, working on new feature and writing up new components in React. So at this point, some of you guys might ask, well, what is Form SG, right? Forms is actually an open source form builder. You can look it up and at opengovsg slash formsg. Formsg is a massive code base. It's actually so big that my language tooling lags for close to 10, 20 seconds when it opens. It's used by government agencies to build forms. And lastly, I hope it's used by you. Like a personal story for me is that my parents actually use Formsg to book their vaccination. So it's just a, it's just a showcase of how the work that we do here actually impact the people around us meaningfully. So at the start, when I came up to forms, here are some of the challenges that I faced, right? Complexity, like with a huge code base, it, very, it becomes really difficult to accomplish or to understand what something is doing. Cleanliness, right? But if we just drop, um, which if we don't think through our code, if we just anyhow write code or we don't delete unneeded stuff, we get incremental technical debt. And that means adding new feature becomes increasingly difficult. And correctness, bugs are expensive. Any time spent, any time spent bug fixing is wasted time for engineers, or worse, it can affect end users. And by end users, I mean you guys in the audience. So before coming into forms, I actually had a bunch of experience working at startups and small to medium-sized companies. But forms is the first truly like really huge code base that I worked on. And I'm going to be sharing with you how I grew to tackle this complexity, how I grew to write clean code, and how I got to write correct code. So firstly, tackling complexity or how I learned to love Legos. Everyone knows, hopefully everyone knows what Legos are. Legos are small, tiny building blocks that you can use to build bigger things. And for forms, our Legos are TypeScript. So forms uses this thing called type-driven development, where we use small little types and we combine them into bigger things. And at the start, actually, I didn't know anything about this. And through asking my mentor and like his help with me, I actually grew to understand that, you know, types can be composed to form greater types, right? So we use types to form the building blocks of our application. What I need, you can see on the right-hand side, like there's this thing called an I-populated form. It's very clear that it's a form and that it has some special two JSON method. And we can see that, you know, there's an encrypted form which has a public key for encryption and it's never emails because there's, we have this thing called email mode. So then we might ask, what is a populated encrypted form? Well, it's simply a form that has populated, that's populated and it's also encrypted. So how do we use this? Well, forms is complex, right? It's huge, but we have to manage it well. So how we do it is we preserve shared knowledge in our types. How it works is that actually your editor can help you to do, to, to type inference and it can have IntelliSense for you. So rather than having to think through about, oh, you know, what thing is here, what is here, we can leverage on our editor, have our intelligence suggest what something is, and we know that to be true at any point in time, right? So after tackling, after knowing how to tackle complexity, the next point is how do we actually improve maintainability? How to write, how do we write code for humans to read, right? I think a lot of the times us as engineers, we tend to want to optimize our code. And we are writing code for computers rather than for humans. And what happens is that we end up with unmaintainable code. So what I mean by this is something like to call fluent methods. And what I mean by fluent methods is that it's easily readable. It's like reading a book. There's a clear logical flow. Method names are descriptive. So this is a rather contrived example, but both of these are still are code that have existed or exists in forms today. So if you compare the one on the left to the one on the right, we can look at the highlighted portions. These are the control flow methods, called the control flow, right? And look at the one on the left, you can tell that, you know, it's really complex. There's a ton of just your eyes moving back and forth, back and forth. You know, there's an if else, there's early returns, there's try catches. We tend to, you know, not understand what the one on the left is doing because there's so many things that we have to wrap our heads around, right? If we were to plot this out on a control flow graph, it tends to look like, you know, there's a huge jumbled up mess. Contrast this to the one on the right. Like, it's so simple. You can tell what the naming is doing and you can, and when you read it, it's top down. It's very clear. It's very articulate. It's good. It's great, in fact. So prior to coming to OGP, right, I'm sad to say sometimes 
or most of the time actually, we tend to write, or for me, I tend to write code that looks like the one on the left. And at OGP, you get really detailed feedback all the time on your PRs everywhere. And you tend to you know, improve, tend to want to do the best. So it gets drilled into you to learn to write clean code, not just for yourself, but for the people around you taking over your work. So th maybe this is something more specific to forms because it's a really mature code base. For me personally, I was guilty of this. I don't tend to delete code. Sometimes the reasoning that I use is, oh, it must have been put there for a reason, right? And through time while working on forms, the thing I realized is that unused, unneeded, all complex code should be removed from the code base because it confuses readers, it adds mental complexity. So there's the first example on the right, you have an unused code. And we tend to, you know, for me, I tend to console log. <laughs> so I know debuggers exist, but sometimes I tend to just console log for the ease of it. And if we don't remove it, it's confusing. People might tend to look at it and go like, hey, what is he console logging here? Was there a reason? Maybe there's no reason. Maybe we just want to log it, the state. Or if there's a potentially unused input, like in the bottom example, where we have B, but B is not the sign in the first, B is only used in the first branch, right? So sometimes people might be scared of touching the variable or removing something just because they think that it might have some usage or that it might be potentially important or, you know, it has existed there, so there must be a reason. But no, working on forms has made me realize that we have to take care in writing code and think through it and make sure that each code goes into it with purpose. So a simple question I like to ask myself when I look at my code is, does it spark joy? It's really simple. To quote Marie Kondo, like if it doesn't spark joy, just throw it out. Just don't be afraid, right? So now for me, after getting feedback, after learning how to write, you know, decently readable code, what we have to do is we have to ensure correctness. And for me, this was the first time that I had working on a code base that was really driven by test. So um, this is the first time and I really had not say no experience, but little experience working on a test driven development code base. So on forms, we actually adopt something called the arrange, act and assert pattern, where first we arrange our dependencies, we act on the function, and then we assert that the result is what you expected, right? So um, how does this work for forms? Forms actually has many layers of tests, but the main ones that I'll be talking about are unit and integration. So for unit testing, it actually tests the basic components of our systems, the Legos that I was talking about just now, right? So this it ensures that these building blocks of your system function as they are meant to. And you can tell that the arrange lock is really long. We're mocking all the dependencies and it's only testing the internal logic of our system. So one thing that this method lacks is that it doesn't test how all this stuff work together, right? So that's what the next part of it is, integration testing. So it tests, now that we know all our Legos are magic, are actual Legos and not, you know, play that magically crumble when put under weight. So now we have to test whether these Legos, when they, when they are stacked together to build, like, you know, your helicopters with Death Stars, do they still work? Well, we can tell from the one on the right that when you see like an arrange block, there's actually no mocking here. Instead, what we're doing is actually we're inserting to a testing database and we're testing the full on control flow with nothing almost being mocked. And so for me, this was actually really new. It's really, and I've emphasized this point many times, but just to give you a sense of some idea, this is from an actual PR that I had. It's a 900 line change, 400 lines of unit tests, 300 lines of integration tests. It's only actual 200 lines of feature. So for me, like you really get the chance to work on a test driven develop, test driven code base, and you get the chance to ensure correctness, to ensure that you know, your code works the way it's supposed to. And you know, writing tests is always good. So like I said, entering correctness is done to writing tests. Testing saves lives, basically, yeah. So um, my time here at OGP has been really meaningful. I've gotten the chance to work on really interesting technical features and challenges. And I've grown as an engineer from, you know, not, know, not knowing what test-driven development was, not knowing how to tackle complexity at scale to understanding how, of, how do we do this, how, do I, how we ensure that our code is correct, how we ensure maintainability for other developers. And if you guys like the chance to work on such meaningful projects, such interesting technical challenges, yeah, please do apply. So that's all from me. I'll hand the time back to Sarah. Thanks, Tin. Uh, thanks so much for sharing. So now we have our last intern, 
uh, Sherry. And our last intern is Ming Jiang. He is a incoming NUS year one student with a double degree in computer science and math, and currently on a three month internship with OGP, working on Postman. Give me a second, I'm gonna uh, share my screen. Present. Share screen. Yes, okay, uh, good day everyone. Hope everyone's having a great evening. I'm Ming Tiang, I'm gonna share about my three month or like 12 week internship in open government products. Um, oh, it's laggy. Okay, so a little bit about me. Uh, my name is Ming Jiang again. Uh, I'm a recent NS survivor, ORD in November, and I'm incoming year one in NUS. Yep. I'll be, as introduced, I'm studying CSMF, and my interests are mostly in web dev, so that's where I started my programming journey, but in the site, I dabbled with some data science stuff, uh, info security stuff. Um, fun fact about myself, I like dabbling with mechanical keyboards, yes, and if you're a mechanical keyboard fan, OGP is actually full of crazy mechanical keyboard nerds. Uh, yes, so uh, leave your favorite switch down in the chat below. Uh, linear gang rise up. Okay, moving on. So previously, uh, I've actually interned in two startups. Uh, this is my third internship. And the first startup, uh, it was a smaller team uh, and things moved really fast there. Uh, and we, it, it was a lot of time spent pushing code. But I will say that um, as a smaller startup, well, there was a less maturity in the sun in terms of engineering practices. And there was also, um, you know, given a smaller team, there's also less room for mentorship. And on the other hand, the second startup that I interned at, um, it was actually founded by a second time founder. And the first company that 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 uh company that that person founder was actually quite successful. He was the CTO there. So actually he brought that kind of mindset of scalability to his second startup and then I realized that I pushed a lot less code there, right? Um, the code was quite complex. And there's a lot of technical complexity built around scaling, around like uh, reliability, uh, horizontal scaling, microservice, stuff like that. And now my third internship here at OGP. How was it like? I feel that at OGP, I found a bit of a middle ground between the two. Uh, I'm pushing code, not as much as the first one, not as little as the second one. But uh, I, I felt that the in terms of, uh, team size, well, OGP is a, a larger team with 30, 40 uh, uh, people and then a huge number of engineers. A lot of these are very, very senior and you find a lot of internship, uh, mentorship opportunities as the previous two people have shared. And of course, what I find and I, what I really, really enjoyed about OGP was that as an intern, you're given a lot of trust. You're working on real products with real issues and making real impact. So these are products that are used by citizens or used by government users where citizens from all walks of life may receive your messages or um, you know, use your product. And I think that that's something special that you, know, you can only find in OGP. You can't find anywhere else in the private sector. So let me share a bit on the project I've worked on. Uh, it's something known as Postman, okay? So Postman is a mass messaging tool for government agencies. Most of you will not be able to see this, will not be able to log into this page because you need a GovSG account to use it but some of you might have received messages sent through Postman. For example, our COVID ops, our vaccination SMSs are all sent through Postman. Or for example, sometimes MTI, MOE, some other agencies do use Postman as well for their mass, mar uh, mass messaging. In fact, Postman was actually invented as one of our hackathon projects and was actually invented you know, to deal with the COVID situation. If you subscribe to the gov.sg WhatsApp group, uh, that was the earlier version of Postman actually and the Telegram channel. So yeah, uh, we are opening this uh, functionality that we, we built to the rest of the government and uh, we support officially SMS, Telegram, and email. Uh, the features of Postman is essentially sort of like a customizable mass message sender. So you can imagine this template on your left. Let's say I want to notify 100 citizens about their appointment dates. Um, you can create a template and use these curly braces to kind of put in fields that are filled in later. After you draft your message, you can then upload this Excel spreadsheet or CSV file rather uh, with a list of email addresses as well as the data that you want to fill in. For example, the names and the date of the appointments. This allows you to you know, reduce manpower. 
And obviously some of these features are, really, are already available through Outlook, like mail merge and whatnot. But what we allow them to do is that we can now send much larger campaigns because we deal with the infrastructure and deal with all that stuff for you. And we're providing value to a lot of government agencies and uh, making them able to uh, communicate to citizens much more easily. Yeah. Uh, I'll talk about the tech stack. Uh, I'm just going like, to go through this quickly. We use Node.js and Express, TypeScript. Uh, on the back end for our databases, we use Redis as a uh, in-memory cache and Postgres for uh, persistence. On the front end, we use React and SAS. So overall, pretty modern technology, I mean, at least by government standards or the serial type of government standards, at least. I think uh, if, you have the if you have this impression that you know, in government you, or public service, you might not be able to work on modern tech. Uh, Please change that impression. Yes. Uh, all our products are also hosted on AWS. Uh, if you would like to take the opportunity to work on stuff like Elastic Beanstalk, um, uh, Lambda, serverless functions, uh, Amplify for serving static assets, uh, you can consider applying here. And if you don't know what any of those mean, don't worry. I'm the same boat. I didn't know any what, what any of those meant. Uh, maybe one or two of them, but like, yeah. So I came here and I learned a lot about cloud stuff. Uh, the issue I worked on uh, is uh, email legitimacy, which is that Postman emails, because you know, we, we wanted to work on spinning up features as fast as we can, looked a bit like phishing emails. Let me give you an example. This was the old design of a Postman email. Uh, first thing you can realize is that the email is in plain text, which in, you know, nowadays, like, uh, people expect government agencies or government emails or legitimate emails in general to just carry more branding. You know? And secondly, uh, you know, the branding of the agency itself is quite lacking. Uh, you can see that this email is sent from postman.gov.sg, but then the user is actually MOE. You have to scroll down to the bottom of the email to see that. And we wanted to change that. As such, we worked on a redesign, or rather our, hard, uh, our hardworking designers uh, came up with this redesign. Some new features are this gov.sg masthead at the top, quite similar to the masthead you'll see on gov.sg websites uh, to tell people that, you know, look out for the email address and don't get fished, right? Uh, it carries the branding from uh, the agency the user is sending from. I'm from OGP, so I get an OGP logo. But if I'm an MOE user, I get an MOE logo. Or MOH user gets MOH logo. And obviously, at the bottom, there's a footer that explains what Postman is, well, how do you unsubscribe, all of that stuff. Yes. Uh, the problem is, emails are really, really tricky. Now, what do I mean by that? Emails, clients, well, first of all, there are tons of email clients. Uh, second of all, each of them have crazy amounts of support for different CSS features. For example, let's say I want to build a custom font in. Uh, in CSS, there's this thing called add font face. You know, you can embed fonts from outside, but turns out, you know, Gmail doesn't support it. Oops, guess you can't use it. Outlook doesn't support it. Mm, well, too bad. Apple News supports it, sure. But then like, if you only want to target iOS users, then uh, you can try it, I guess. Next, pop quiz. What rendering engine do you think Microsoft, Office, uh, Microsoft Outlook uses? Do you think it's uh, Internet Explorer? Do you think it's Chromium? Like, you know, Microsoft Edge. Let's take a look. Microsoft Outlook uses the rendering engine from Microsoft Word. It's a word processing software, not a HTML rendering engine. But, you know, I, I never knew that. Oh, I learned something new today. Um, what does that mean, right? What does that realistically mean? It means that, number one, Outlook does really weird things. For example, if you have divs, any of you with HTML experience might know this, uh, it's a basic building block of almost all layouts. But it doesn't support padding, so you basically can't do anything in an Outlook. Uh, so yeah, you use tables for, all the, uh, for everything, and you use something called conditional rendering. So for example, uh, if you have coded uh, websites like you know, uh, before the HTML5 days, you might recognize this. If MSO or if IE9 or if true, you know, these are conditional rendering that's seen as comments by most browsers, but then it is actually seen as an uh, actual uh, conditional by IE9 and uh, IE and Outlook, and they will render as such. So that's what I did to you know do some Outlook specific styles. Uh, next, Gmail, the great almighty Gmail. Apparently, some versions of Gmail, if you use the Gmail mobile app and connect to a certain email addresses, it doesn't support style text. What does that mean? I have a mobile version of my email and I want to get it. Um, you know, to scale and be responsive. But I need responsive, for responsive design, I need media queries, right? Uh, the problem is that to use media queries, you need a style tag and Gmail doesn't support it. So, uh, eh. well, there's a, there's a trick, which is using inline styles and putting non-essential styles. So inline styles like style equal whatever in the tag. And yeah, uh, only the non-essential styles are at the top. So yeah, et cetera, et cetera. There are way too many to list. Uh, I don't want to go on and you don't want to listen to this. 
I worked really hard, 876 line PR, go in, merged. High point, one week later. Some of you might remember this tweet. Uh, it was last year, uh, last month rather. Uh, so I read it, I was like, oh, haha, -ha, intern, haha. -ha. Uh, I guess who's interning too. Uh, yeah, I received this Slack message one day, June 29, 1131. Appears to be a prod issue with email sending now. I thought about it, like, wait, in the last deployment, what exactly did we push? I looked at the code again. I did a bit of refactoring, you know, like you, you want to keep the code base clean, you do a bit of refactoring. So this is uh, some code. Uh, it's a promise essentially. Uh, and I refactored to this. If you are returning a promise, this is a function that returns a promise in TypeScript, right? Uh, I check uh, with my validator if it's a valid email. I reject it with an error if it's not, and I resolve if it is. And I continue then, 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 so on and so forth. So I thought, you know, I read up a bit, okay? So throwing an error inside a uh, promise, that's the same. Uh, throwing an error is the same thing as rejecting a promise, right? I mean, like, I'm pretty sure that's the same thing. Uh, so what, what was wrong? I look at it, look at it, see if you can spot it. Um, actually, you probably couldn't spot it because I like, uh, yeah, actually there was a catch statement below. I didn't realize that. Oh, okay. Uh, rapid fix, rapid fix, 14 lines, 14 lines, merge. Okay, yes, perfect way to get extra green square on my GitHub. Uh, but <laughs> a few emails might have been dropped along the way. Oops. But okay, yeah, obviously it was terrible. Um, I'm a bit apologetic, but I was very thankful because my team actually was very, very, I mean, what I found was that in OGP, we don't have a blame, we have a blame-free culture. But we did obviously a post-mortem, look at why this happened. But obviously code goes through code review. Uh, the reviewer also missed this and we realized that, you know, it's not really the fault of a single programmer. Uh, errors happen and we just uh, looked at the steps on how to mitigate this and prevent this from happening in the future. And that was something I really, really liked about OGP. Uh, yeah, I mean, I can change my previous slide to this. But anyways, so let me just go through five main reasons why you should pick OGP, okay? Number one, modern tech stack, modern tooling. I don't need to talk more about this. If you want to get the opportunity to work with AWS and other modern tech stack, don't get the impression that you can't get that in the public sector, right? OGP is one of those places where you can find it. Number two, there's a very strong team with good mentorship. You can trust that um, whoever you are, whichever team you work in, your coworkers will be competent, will be able to provide mentorship to you as a junior developer, and there's a huge amount of space for you to grow. Number three, you get to solve interesting problems. I mean, how many places in the private sector can you really say that? Uh, are you like just trying to earn a few extra decimal places of dollar signs? I don't know, right? Uh, you're optimizing not for profit, but for public good, right? Here you are, I mean, you can join the vaccine ops team. You're building literally the system that prevents queues from forming outside every vaccine center. You are for, you're building um, forms, you know, like helping to reduce paper waste for the, the whole of Singapore. Like without form as you, maybe we will not make a lot of transition to digital form so quickly. Number four, high trust, minimal supervision. Uh, working hours are super flexible. Attire is super flexible. Uh, the average OGP person comes in with flip-flops and a, a t-shirt and shorts. So it's like pretty much a normal CS class. Uh, yeah, and similar to Google with their 20% time, we actually have Learning Friday. So every Friday, we actually dedicate it for you to take your own time off to go and read up on your own. I got the opportunity to do a lot of technical reading that I wouldn't otherwise have the time to. And as designers or as engineers, you're, uh, uh, you're recommended to kind of cross-read and then learn about other things from the other uh, sector sections. And last but not least, most important, WeWork is actually pretty cool. So uh, our office is based out of WeWork in Funan. It's downtown, it's pretty um, convenient. And uh, there is actually free beer and kombucha on Friday. So, you know, that's the perfect reason why you should sign out if you're still in doubt. Uh, obviously now with COVID uh, restrictions, that's kind of stopped. But hopefully by next summer or in winter, you know, if you come by anytime, uh, these restrictions will ease and then you'll get to enjoy the free beer and kombucha. So I'd like to wrap up with this, okay? Your nation needs you. Sign on, I mean, sign up now, yes. Okay, head to that link, check it out. Um, if any of you have any questions, uh, leave them down in the pigeonhole. But if you're too shy, feel free to hit me up, okay? Uh, a lot of you have seen my Telegram spam, uh, sorry, advertisement. Uh, you can hit me up on Telegram. If not, uh, LinkedIn, add me, connect with me. Or, you know, just ping me on GitHub. I don't know how you're going to message me on GitHub. Uh, good luck with that. If you figure it out, uh, you get a bonus point. I'll tell them that uh, this guy is cool or this, this person is cool. Yes, uh, that's all for me. Thank you so much for your time. 
Thanks so much, Ming Jian. We want to transition to the Q&A panel. So if you haven't already, please uh, scan this QR code to access the pigeonhole. Um, and you can answer the passcode here, OGPSWE. Um, but we have a few questions already. So I'm just going to dive right into it. Uh, the first question with 21 votes, do interns from private universities or alternative pathways stand a chance in being an intern for OGP? There is a belief that applicants of such groups are shut out from public sector jobs. Um, so we, uh, in addition to our interns, uh, we also have Russell, who is our people, um, people ops representative here. Um, so I think Russell, maybe you can get started with this question. Great, uh, thanks, Sarah. So, so I, I'll, I'll try and keep it short. I've, I've seen a bunch of questions here as well. I'll try to answer a few at the same time, right? So there's a question on private unis. There's some questions about what are the skills we're actually looking for? Uh, do personal projects actually matter? Right, I'm gonna answer that uh, in, in a nutshell. The short answer directly to this question is yes, people from all sorts of background interns or candidates from all sorts of backgrounds definitely stand a chance. We've had uh, interns with us, we've had full-timers with us from private uni backgrounds, even people who don't come from traditional uh, context backgrounds. This comes back to very much uh, the question of uh, what are the skills we are looking for? So fundamentally, when we think about uh, interns and even full-timer hires, we think about things in three main things. We're not saying what's the specific tech stack you've worked on. We're not looking for a specific uni education. We just ask, us, ask ourselves these three things and that's how we build our interviews. Firstly, can, you, can the person think? Can the person code? And can the person talk about code? So it, when you say, can a person think, what do you mean is, can they reason about code? Can they identify possible approaches to a problem? Know the trade-offs, commit to one, uh, despite drawbacks, you know, make a call on things. When we talk about, can they code? It's, are they comfortable in developer environments, uh, development environments? Are they familiar with practices? Do they know how to use tooling, right? Can they talk about code? That's like, can they collaborate well with others? And we're not just talking about engineers and conveying technical ideas to one another, but it's also engaging with a non-technical audience or cross-functional teams to, to talk about the same. Why do I explain that? It's because when you look at those skills, so fundamentally that's more important to us than saying what's a specific tech stack skill that someone has. We build our uh, assessments as well around this. We're testing how people can actually think code and talk about code during our assessments. And we're quite happy to bring in people, internships full-time, uh, uh, as long as they do that. So case in point, you know, when we do our uh, interview assessments, yes, we've gone through some of the tech stacks that we use in our various products. Uh, our assessments are actually uh, language agnostic. You pick whatever language you're comfortable in, we want to see you code at your best, not just to a specific language we do, because uh, that's what we're looking for. Uh, when we find good people, find good interns that we put in through, and we give them an offer even, we, what we do is we give them standing offers, right? Some of our best interns haven't even started university yet, right? We've got poly interns, for example. Uh, and what we do is we say, actually, if we find someone good, we'll give them an offer. If they don't go to university, if they drop out of school, the, the short answer is we'll be happy to take you in, because the truth is you prove, the person's proven that they've got the skills, they've proven they can do the job. That's what matters to us at the end of the day. Okay, thanks Russell. Uh, anyone have anything else to add? If not, I'll move on to the next question uh, with 19 votes. Are there any specific technologies, tech stacks that would be good to, to be proficient in to improve one's chances of landing an internship at OGP? Uh, yeah, uh, maybe I'll give a quick answer. I think Russell mostly answered this in the previous question, but uh, I will say that OGP uses TypeScript for almost all our projects, just so it's simpler for working on both front-end and back-end. So once, one thing about OGP is that most of the engineers we hire are actually full-stack. So uh, it will be helpful, though it's absolutely not necessary. We have had interns come in with only backgrounds in mobile development or, or in other stuff. Uh, and I believe I received a telegram message from someone, uh, you're down in chat there, uh, about data science internships. We are opening data science internships as well. I spoke to our data scientist, Laura. Uh, she said that uh, feel free to send in, make an application, send in your resume, uh, and she will be open to take a look at your resume as well. So just in case you come from you know, backgrounds that are not software or web development focused, uh, don't worry about that. Uh. Okay, thanks, Ming Jiang. Um, so next question, uh, with 18 votes, how does OGP differ from other IT-related government bodies such as CSIT, DSTA, or CSA? Uh, Hong, can you help answer this one? Yeah, um, so there's a bunch of different ways. Um, so the first one is that OGP is just in terms of like how we work. 
uh, in terms of mandate. Um, so most other government agencies are design, uh, government IT agencies are designed to sort of like build things that uh, have been requested by other departments or by the bosses or by whatever. So they have a particular portfolio or a particular area. The requirements come down, then they sort of build things according to requirements. OGP works uh, sort of the other way around, where our job is to try and figure out what are the best things that should be built that don't exist, build those, and then try to get them and try to get people to use them. So the plus side of this is that you have a lot of autonomy to like try to build the things that you want to build. The downside of this is that you need to fight to get your things adopted. So if you were working at CSA or DSDA or CSIT, um, you have a user built in because they are asking you to build this or that, and so on and go. Whereas OGP, we have to like build the stuff and then we have to like go around and like shop it around and see whether or not they get users. And often you just start with one trial somewhere. And every single one of our products, which um, started with just like someone willing to be like, hey, okay, well, this seems, this is new, but let me try it out. Uh, so that's one big difference. Uh, the second big difference is in just in terms of like the foundations of how we operate. Um, OGP, so I mean, I think everyone is sort of together in this in terms of wanting to digitize the government. Um, but uh, for a lot of the government agencies, you have a lot of sort of legacy systems and a lot of approaches that, you know, you're trying to modernize and digitize. So they have a big portfolio that they have, a, that, you know, they sort of last 20, 30 years worth of IT systems that they are trying to, that they need to bring along and, and bring up to sort of modern standards. OGP takes the opposite approach, which is that we sort of start from the premise of like, okay, let's have one place where we can have the new, where, where we can start afresh and build something new and then work backwards to try and see uh, what systems that we can integrate with. So it depends on which way you want to go. Um, on the one hand, like, you know, our approach, we get a lot more greenfield, but it, 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 but then it's very, you know, it's a lot more work to go integrate backwards into all the things that other people need, uh, into all the existing incumbent systems. The other way you get to sort of like deal with incumbent systems, but then if you want to reach forward to like add new features or like try using new technologies, it's harder. So that's why we, that's why, that's why there are these sort of like tandem of approaches. Um, so yeah, hopefully that makes sense. Um, OGP is a lot smaller than these other agencies, just to give you guys an order of magnitude. Like we are about like 50 people compared to like the thousands that are in these other agencies. Um, so yeah, that, that's, a, that's, a, that's another reference point if that makes sense. Okay, thanks Hong. Uh, so moving on to the next question, what are the skills required to be an intern in OGP? I think uh, Russell mentioned a little bit, but I would love to give the interns a chance to, to share their thoughts on this. What do you all think are the skills required to be an intern at OGP? Maybe Chin, you want to start? Yeah, sure. Um, I think for me, right, what broke what what are skills required? Firstly, there's like hard skills, obviously. Like, can you reason about code and can you think through the drawbacks, all the benefits to being to implementing a particular solution? I think something that OGP challenges us on, where I have no experience elsewhere, is actually communicating about code, which is which is that um, how did, how are you able to present your solution across to other people, right? Because when you build a new feature, for example, um, the impact is not just on you or a small group of people, but it's actually a lot of people. Like for forms, it will affect basically government users as well as public users. So firstly, not just hard skills, but soft skills in communication, in being able to enunciate and think through and uh, elucidate your thoughts about just your approach. I think those are the things which OGP differs from other places. And concretely, I think um, values and personality-wise, I think um, one thing they do need to have is the drive to learn and the drive to, you know, just constantly be asking questions. Because I believe that some of them have mentioned it, everyone is more than well, is more than happy to answer your questions. Yeah, so I think those are the few things ranging from soft to hard skills to just personality, what sort of some of the things that, um, what are some of the skills required? Maybe some of the other interns could answer this as well. Yeah, Ahmed Mingjiang, anything to add? Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'll just share, I think uh, there's two parts to this, right? It's like uh, one of those kind of skills that in order to be an intern, so there's sort of uh, things that they look out for interviews, I think maybe. Uh, for my personal experience, is really uh, focused, like what Chin was saying, you know, the idea of reasoning about code, uh, but also, one of the key experiences I had during my interview was the notion that, you know, the sort of projects that I worked on, I think my interview at the time actually went to go into the code base that I put on my resume and then questioned me on what I wrote. And that sort of uh, experience for me uh, sort of revealed a nature where the idea of communicating, communicating about code, but more importantly, taking the initiative to understand why the code is there in the first place. And I think when it comes to, you know, the sort of personality, the sort of attitude that you need, 
uh, in order to really sort of, I maybe just try as an intern here in OGP is uh, you cannot be afraid to question. You cannot be uh, afraid to take the initiative to ask, uh, to sort of, you know, involve yourself in these kind of discussions and understand beyond just, okay, I need to do this, but why am I doing this? What is it for? To take a look at the bigger picture and, you know, be able to work with other people towards that bigger picture. I think it's some of the, I would say softer skills. Yeah, I think hard skills, it's, to me, it's uh, quite straightforward. There's, there's nothing particular, you know, you just all around. Uh, you, know, you just sort of expect it to learn uh, whatever it is that they do. I think, uh, I think, I think it was either Ming Chiang or Chin was saying that uh, most projects use TypeScript, but not all projects. Project I was working on was using JavaScript uh, and they were using a lot of different libraries and it was just sort of just expected to pick it up. Uh, and it's not, it's, it's not technology focused. You don't really care what technology you know already. You know, you can learn, but the, the way you think and the way you sort of reason about your code, uh, I think is more important in sort of like how you can really try, maybe not just as an intern, but also as a software engineer in OGP. Okay, thanks Ahmed. Um, thank you all for sharing. So next question, I'll pass this one to Russell. Are international students eligible to apply for the internship position? Hey, thanks for that question. So, so the short answer is, unfortunately, we're not able to consider international students for internships. Uh, Singaporeans and PRs, uh, we, we can. Um, so it's, it's an unfortunate call because I, I know, you know there are really, really strong people coming from the international crowd, uh, probably some of you here as well. But unfortunately, as a government agency, that's something that we, we uh, do for interns, which is that we look at Singaporeans and PRs. Thanks, Russell. Uh, so next question. Uh, oh, okay. How important are personal projects for a software intern? Is it essential to have learned, have a computer science background to apply for the software internship? Uh, I'll, I'll let anyone jump on it, but a quick answer. So I, I, I mentioned this a bit at the start as well, where personal projects aren't, well, I, I touched on it a little bit, they're, they're not necessarily a prerequisite. Uh, what we look for, right, is how people think and make decisions and how they code. The benefit of having personal projects is that it gives you something you can talk about and show that you've done that thinking, you've got experience developing things. But, but it's not that we'll look at it and say, hey, you don't have a personal project, you're immediately out the door. We, we don't do that. Thanks, Russell. Um, um, any, if anyone else wants to add to that. Yeah, um, as a whole, uh, it definitely helps to have a computer science background. I wouldn't say it's necessary. We definitely have some uh, sort of sui, sui interns and full-timers actually who didn't have a traditional background uh, in computer science. Um, uh, in terms of personal projects, so I think you should have something to show that you're interested in coding. Um, basically, that's it. And so uh, like, that's what we look out for. It, you, we, we screen resumes by based on like, okay, does this person seem like they're, like if you have no computer science experience, no projects, no nothing, we probably won't look at you as an intern. Um, but if you've got a degree or you've got projects or you've got something along those lines, it's probably worth chatting to. And the most important thing I would say isn't so much about like, oh, number of personal projects, and all, but like if you have stuff that you can talk about why you like coding, what you've built about it, why you make the choices you make and you can really deep dive into it, that's what matters more than any particular number of projects, kinds of projects or background. What matters is you, know, you show that you care about the work that you build. Thanks, Hong. Uh, so next question we have, how is crunch time at OGP? Is there a lot of OT? So maybe our interns, you can, you can be honest. <laughs> How is crunch time at OGP? Maybe, maybe, I, maybe I can start because <laughs> uh, I'm not having a crunch time right now. Yeah, I very, very had time to grab my dinner before this. Uh, but I think it's, uh, they're actually, how to put it, everyone actually tries really hard to stop you from working. Okay, this is a personal experience. I remember uh, the, the previous crunch time I had, uh, I was trying to sort of uh, promise a sort of delivery on a certain feature and then uh, I, I, I tried, I was pushing code at like 7pm and I had my mentor text me and he was like, I need to stop pushing code after office hours. And I was like, oh, okay. <laughs> I was like, you're, you're still real and that sort of thing. And yeah, from, from my experience, it's like everyone has this culture where they just want to deliver because the work you do is impactful. You really want to, you want to sort of contribute, you want to build, and, and you know everyone in the team is really putting their weight into it. Uh, but there's also a culture where they really try their best to make sure that you take time to yourself, that you really sort of you know uh, watch out, and we look out for each other. It's more than just I feel like it's more than just uh, deliver by this day. It's also uh, hey, if you can't, it's okay. You know we're a team, you can look out for each other, and 
yeah, it was very heartening, I guess. Uh, at first, I thought my mentor was joking. So the next day, I went to push code at 7 p.m. again. And then he, he really, like, sat me down. And was like, look, you know, you should just spend some time. You know, this isn't everything and this sort of thing. Yeah, this is personal experience. <laughs> Anyone else want to share? Thanks, Ahmed. Um, so I know we're at 9. So I just want to, uh, and we have a lot more questions. But I think we only have time for maybe one more question, uh, which is, what is the interview process like? So I'll leave it to Russell to answer this first. And uh, interns, please feel free to jump on. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you the, the bare bones of what it actually is. You guys can jump on on what it was experienced as. Um, so our interview process is basically you would apply, uh, you put in your CV, uh, and then we'll of course look at that, look at, at the work you've done. Uh, we do a quick uh, online coding assessment, which you can then do kind of your own leisure. The point of that assessment isn't so much for a stretch test. It's just basically make sure you can code. Right, so if you do clear that bar, we bring you in therefore for a well, virtual interview now that consists of both a resume deep dive as well as a hands-on coding assignment uh, assessment. Uh, so as I mentioned before, the way we do the coding assessments is that they are, uh, the, that they are focused on uh, actually testing whether you can code, think about code and talk about it. So it's not language specific, you code in your own IDE, you share your screen, basically we, you set yourself up so you're coding at your best. The way we ask questions is they're not specifically theoretical algorithms or data structure kind of questions. They're actually messy open-ended questions with multiple uh, ways to answer it that come in parts. And they're designed to you coding throughout the whole thing because we're, we're looking at how you code and how you think. Um, that interview is basically with your potential intern manager and then that's basically the, the on and all. The intern manager can make a call whether or not we'll offer you an internship. Uh, so, sorry, I don't hand on quickly. Uh, for a quick answer, because someone's asking about the part, I know there's some part-time things. We don't, we, we only do full-time internships up to, 12 weeks minimum. Beyond that, if people want a part-time after that, uh, we are able to, but we don't do part-time as a default, mainly because of how we treat our interns as we heard, which is we plug them into full-time uh, alongside the full-timers and they learn alongside that way. So we don't have like projects hived off to the side for people to do, and therefore it actually makes it quite difficult for part-time interns to learn and keep up. Uh, so it actually ends up being a disservice to part-time interns, which is why we've quite deliberately chosen to structure it that way, mainly for intern learning benefit as well. Sorry, over to everyone else. Uh, I'm going to jump in quickly. Uh, some comments about lead code in the in the chat. Uh, I would like to make this like at least in my experience, right? Uh, at least for the OGP internship uh, experience, I can't speak for other companies, right? Uh, don't spend your time with lead code. Seriously, like uh, the if you are doing lead code, the codeity test I estimate at an easy at best medium. So it's really just a coding test to get sure that you can and can code. Like. I mean, obviously in the exams, if you need some practice to kind of get used to the, uh anxiety that comes with an actual interview, then sure, go and do some. But don't spend all your time on it. Instead, spend your time on either doing projects that you are interested in, or at least just working on something that you find fun. You know, coding shouldn't be so dry, and like you shouldn't be spending 10 hours a day. Um, especially if you are not from a comp science background, right? Um, I don't think that lead code is the way to go, at least for the OGP internship. Can't speak for other places. Uh, spend your time working on projects that you're passionate about, solving real problems using code. Uh, I personally come from a web dev background because I, I find that web dev is the easiest to roll out new projects, you know, through over a hackathon or whatever. Uh, and especially if there are a lot of freshmen down in chat, I'll recommend everyone not to spend your freshman year grinding lead code. You're going to regret it. Like, uh, at least when I started learning coding, if I, I knew that if I started Doing, uh, by doing lead code, I'll probably lose the passion for it like in, in a few years, uh, in a few months, probably. Yeah. Uh, other interns, anything there? Yeah, uh, just to jump in on the interview process, um, I think a more a useful metric would be to contrast it against the past interviews that I've had, right? Because I've had face-to-face uh, -face interviews. I think the main difference here is that even at the interviewing stage where they're actually like, you know, uh, running you through your code, watching how you code, they are actually not concerned with just correctness. They are actually more concerned with how we think, um, how you design your code. For example, things like variable namings. Why do you choose a particular name? Or like, why do you use a particular data structure? Is there a possible extensions? And it's more than just, you know, making sure your, your solutions passes all the test case. It's not just that because we understand that bugs can and will pop up at some point. It's, it's more the ability to, you know, uh, write actual maintainable code, reason about why your code is the way that it is, and communicate across, you know, possible drawbacks of your code or, you know, possible future extensions of your code. Yeah. I, and also, as Ahmed mentioned, the, even if you are rejected, I mean, I hope not, but they still do give you really detailed feedback. And I think it is just a really useful process to go through. They care a lot about you, even if you just apply. Yeah. 
Thanks so much, Chin, for, for that insight. Um, and now I realize it's 9.05, so want to close it off here, and I'll pass it to Russell uh, for a few last words. All right, thanks, Sarah. So, uh, thanks again, everyone, really, for attending and for spending your time with us. Uh, hope you've enjoyed the sharing, but hopefully it's informative for you. So really, I know we talked a, a lot about the internship and you've heard from the interns themselves. Uh, we encourage you to check out the internship opportunities. So we do hire interns uh, year round. Uh, and we're, we're quite flexible on when interns come in, what level you're at, and we've talked about this before, right? So if you're thinking about it, just go to our website, take a look at the internships. Even if you're just curious, go to our website, just check out uh, more about what we do there. Um, yeah, so uh, lastly, we're having another sharing next week as well. So this week, today has been about the software engineer interns. So thanks everybody for sharing. We have uh, three more interns sharing next week uh, about their, their experience as product design interns. So we really encourage you to come along uh, to listen to the work that they've been doing. Come along, listen to them, ask your friends to come along or, or share the word with your friends if they're interested. And uh, we're looking forward to seeing you there as well as seeing your applications and questions come in there uh, on our, on our uh, job page as well. So thanks very much everyone and have a good evening. And uh, just a comment, uh, winners of the t-shirts will be contacted shortly via email. So look out for that. Thank you, everybody. <laughs> have a good night. Bye everyone, good night. See you, night night.